and welcome to Games is Lit 101. Back in 2003, Michael Ansel, the creator of the Rayman series, worked on a project with Ubisoft Monte Monte Montepellier 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 that word. He enjoyed working on the Rayman series, of course, but he wanted to try something different this time around. His first goal with this game was to create a large, living, breathing, open world that players could explore at will with no limitations. His second was to create a compelling and meaningful story amidst all of that freedom. Now, we talked about open worlds a couple episodes back, and some of the narrative difficulties that can arise from allowing the player that much freedom. So, while it's always sad to see original ideas get downsized, it's not too surprising to know that that level of freedom didn't really make it into the final product. This is partially because of the small team, of around only 30 people or so, but also partially because when the team revealed their game, Beyond Good and Evil, at E3 2002, the reception wasn't particularly positive. After that, the game underwent a good few changes, including an art shift to a more colorful palette, and a bit of a reduction in the exploration elements of the game. Even so, after all of those changes, Beyond Good and Evil was still something of a labor of love for Ansel. He's stated in multiple interviews since then that it has a really special place in his heart. But unfortunately, when it was released, it didn't sell particularly well. This is largely due to a lot of other big releases coming out at around the same time, like Jack 2, Mario Kart Double Dash, the original Call of Duty, uh, even Ubisoft's own Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time. Ansel has said that the team realized partway through development that the game would need some time to grow on people, rather than being immediately appealing to a mass audience. Unfortunately, the large volume of big releases caused Beyond Good and Evil to fade into the background, despite its excellent critical reception. Since then, it's become something of a cult classic, beloved by almost all who play it, even if that number is still tragically small. It's been praised for having a strong, complex female protagonist, and the Hillian Suite was even featured in the video game's live concert series. And, as you may have guessed, it has enough narrative strength to be worth talking about on this show. So, as always, spoilers abound in this literary analysis. This is one of the greats, so I highly recommend that you go play it yourself before seeing the rest of this video. So, that out of the way, let's dive into Beyond Good and Evil. The game takes place on the planet Hillis, where an invasion is ongoing. A mysterious alien race called the Doms have been laying siege to the planet for years, and the only thing protecting the people of Hillis from complete domination is a military force called the Alpha Sections, who have put the planet under martial law to help combat the Doms' threat. But for once, we're not following the military in this story. No, our protagonist is Jade, a young woman who lives at a lighthouse where she shelters children who have been orphaned by the Doms. Also at the lighthouse is her uncle, Paige, who... Yeah, uncle is an entirely metaphorical term, but we'll go with it. Jade also works as a freelance photojournalist, and one of the jobs she takes ends up getting her involved with the Iris Network, an underground resistance who claims that the Alpha Sections are actually in league with the Doms, and are responsible for a number of disappearances that are slowly eating away at Hillis's population. Thanks to Double H, we now know where the victims are taken to on Hillis. 1. The Neutropils Factory 2. The Old Slaughterhouse in the Shuttles 3. The Moon in a Cargo Cruiser An agent called Double H went to investigate, but has since disappeared. Jade is hesitant at first. Yeah, I'd like to know too. Like, who's actually telling the truth in all this? But goes along with it to see where it leads. No harm in confirming the truth, right? Jade, you'll have to pick a code name to sign your articles with. Shawnee. You catch that? That's going to be important later. Remember that. Jade sneaks into the Neutropils factory, and Paige goes along with her in hopes of helping to keep her safe. Okay, we're going to have to keep on our toes now, Jade. Don't worry, Uncle Paige. We'll just take some pictures and get home. Jade discovers Double H being tortured by a Dom's machine of some kind, and after getting photographic evidence, she frees him and saves his life. He's clearly frazzled. Are you Double H? Not... not sure. Does the iris mean anything to you? Listen here, Miss Thyrus. Jade. My name is Jade.
and he immediately cements himself as the sincere but dorky comic relief supporting character. Unfortunately, fate seems to take an eye for an eye, and while Jade and Paige are separated, the Alpha Sections find and abduct him. It's worth noting that this is a few hours into the game at this point, and Beyond Good and Evil uses a lot of the same character development techniques as Prince of Persia The Sands of Time, most notably the way that dialogue is peppered throughout the gameplay to keep you with a constant connection to these characters. Combine that with the fact that that dialogue is pretty well written, and Paige's abduction here is a much bigger deal in the game itself than this little summary is really able to communicate. Now with personal motivation, Jade continues through the factory and discovers two major developments. Firstly, there is indeed human trafficking going on here, and secondly, the Alpha Sections have been physically altered by the Doms, more or less confirming their affiliation. And remaining doubt is quelled when Jade barely misses Paige, but walks in on a discussion between a soldier of the Alpha Sections and some kind of important-looking Doms creature. So at this point, we know that the Doms and the Alpha Sections are indeed connected, and that they're abducting people. Why? We don't know. But Jade is in this to figure out the truth now, as well as saving her uncle. Jade and Double H meet up again, and Jade rushes him to the Iris Network when he starts suffering from some sort of DOMS-related infection, presumably similar to what happened to the Alpha Sections. They rush him back in time to stop the spread, and Double H, ever the soldier, continues to work with Jade as they head to the slaughterhouse to try and get Paige back. WWTAO, we work together as one. Carlson and Peters, page 823. It's worth noting at this point that Beyond Good and Evil has an incrementally open world, so while that's not nearly as large and free as Michael Ansel originally imagined it, there are still a variety of activities the player can do between these major missions. These activities tend to range from playing a table hockey-like game with a shark man, chasing bandits through caves, and infiltrating the alpha sections in order to get pearls, which are Dom's artifacts that you can use to buy black market upgrades for your ship from the Jamaican rhinos at the Mamago Garage. Mama go garage, you know. Where your mama won't go, you know. What? Hey, if you didn't figure out this game was weird already, here you go. This game is weird. But it's a quirky, charming kind of weird, and I, I've never been one to think that weirdness handicaps meaning or depth. Anyway, purchasing upgrades for the ship is what allows the player to access more and more areas of the game world. This is the type of thing I was talking about in the Open Worlds episode. Gameplay systems in place to control the player's journey through a gradually expanding game world, letting them into more and more areas as the story demands it. It takes some finagling to get into the slaughterhouse, but they manage to sneak in, and they get photographic evidence of the abducted people being sent to the Alpha Section's lunar base. They don't manage to get Paige, though, and return to the Iris headquarters just in time to get a transmission from the Grand Master of the whole Iris network, saying he's been taken to the moon and- Wild Boar calling Iris! Wild Boar calling Iris! Hey, that's my uncle! Paige! Your uncle? Paige has been the leader of the revolution this whole time? Okay, I, I know this seems kind of out of the blue here, but this was actually foreshadowed in the game. Like, with, uh, with how Paige has an established dislike of the Alpha Sections, and how he immediately told Jade not to go see Mr. DeCastellac. He clearly didn't want to get her involved in all of this. And, uh, and the way that he purposefully never went in to the Iris Network's headquarters under the Akuta Bar. And... Okay, let's... Suffice it to say... The game foreshadows this in plenty of ways that are a bit too subtle for a general summary like this to include. <sighs> this is why I tell you guys to play the game first. Anyway, Jade takes this as confirmation that he's alive, and starts working to restore his spacecraft, the Beluga, for the purpose of going up to the moon and exposing the Alpha sections for good. But upon returning to the lighthouse with all the necessary parts, the lighthouse is destroyed and the kids are gone. This is the breaking point for Jade, and she has a difficult reflection. Poor Wolf. I know how you are. You tried to help them. 
You told yourself that you wouldn't let them come to any harm. That you'd be there to protect them. I know, boy. But that isn't what actually happened. The kids are gone. And you... You couldn't do anything. You're, you're here, alive and well. Who do you think you are? Did you think you'd actually be able to make a difference? Well, Wolf, you were wrong, boy. Completely and utterly wrong. See, Jade started this whole thing off in search of the truth. She's a journalist, after all, so the, the possibility that the people of Hillis were being deceived by the Alpha sections didn't sit well with her. When Paige was taken, of course, it became more personal, but since then, she's started to see the bigger picture. This isn't just about the people that she loves. This is about Hillis, everyone on the planet. And somewhere in there, she began to believe that she could actually save them all from the Alpha Sections. Until this whole thing started, she expressed her desire to do good, to help the people of Hillis by taking care of these orphans. Until she was presented with the opportunity to help save the entire planet, this was the work she was doing for the good of Hillians. With this move by the Alpha Sections, the symbol of the good she can actually accomplish was destroyed. This kind of personal blow is exactly the kind of thing that can break people, that can make them give up on a bigger goal. She feels disempowered, like she has no business trying to save Hillis if she can't even protect the orphans she's had under her care. Thankfully, Double H knows it won't take much to snap her out of it. They're still alive, Miss Jade. Paige, the kids, they're all still alive. Jade's ultimate desire here is to do right by all of these suffering people. And, as with anyone, that desire is multiplied exponentially when those people include someone that you love. All that she needs to be reminded of here is that this isn't over yet. They're still alive. She hasn't missed her chance. She can still do good here. This is the primary characteristic of Jade's character in relation to her actions her desire to do right by the people around her, and accomplish great things for them. With the Beluga now space ready, Jade and Double H head up to the moon. The Alpha Sections broadcast their propaganda across Hillis from there, so Iris plans to use their broadcasting capabilities to send Jade's reports across the entire planet at once, inspiring the people of Hillis to rise up against the Alpha Sections and break their authoritative hold on the planet. When they get up there, they come across Paige, locked in a prison and unconscious. Jade gets him out, but... I'll come back for you. I'll bring you back home. Vowing to come back when she's done to bring him back home, she leaves in sorrow. But she doesn't get far. Paige is alive again. He confirms that he was dead, but Jade brought him back. He says she always had some kind of energy inside of her, and it brought him back to life. The game has had mystical undertones this whole time, but this is the first time anything that seems blatantly magical has happened. Don't worry, it makes sense. Sorta. The best course of action at this point is decided. Wrap up the decisive report and broadcast it to all of Hillis simultaneously. And indeed, a bit more espionage work lands Jade as a secret observer to a meeting with General Keck and the Dom's High Priest, in which the High Priest says that the last of his life energy is leaving him, and Keck needs to use the last of his energy to bring him Shawnee. Jade, Page, and Double H manage to broadcast the photographic evidence, rallying the Hillians against the Alpha sections. General Keck destroys the broadcast tower and traps the Beluga in a tractor beam when our heroes escape. 
After defeating him, Keck claims that the Doms have already killed everyone. We've sucked them dry of all their fluids so that we could live longer. <coughs> He's looking for you. He's been on your trail for centuries. Your days are numbered. The Beluga works its way back to the lunar base with the help of the Hillians, who show up to give their support. But things are never this simple. Their escape cut off, our heroes descend into the lair of the Dom's High Priest, who explains that it may look like they've been attacking Jade and generally hurting Hillis as a whole, but it's actually all about ethics and game journalism. <laughs> okay, that didn't happen. That would be completely stupid. You are not who you think you are. The pagan has hidden your origins from me. Jade, no! Don't listen to him! <laughs> Source of my powers, the instrument of my strength. They took you away in the hope of destroying me, but I have survived, feeding me with only the most miserable of sacrifices. They made you human, but you are not like them. You are mine, Johnny, and I am going to kill the human part of you. David! Johnny Dom Yendra! Okay, this is where things get a bit crazy. There's a lot left to our imaginations with this when it comes to the backstory and the world building, and it, it was probably all meant to be filmed in by the sequel. We'll talk about the sequel in due time. Basically, what we know is that Jade is essentially some kind of ancient, powerful being that the Doms depend on, like their life force or something. That being is Shawnee. It's not clear whether Jade is just Shawnee in human form, or a human with Shawnee fused with her, but either way, she was stolen from the Doms sometime in the past, either by her parents or Paige. She's been kept from the Doms for a long time, and their power has been dwindling. Much of their efforts as of late have been to locate her and regain their full strength. It's important to note that, right now, Jade is fighting for her soul. Her entire world has been turned upside down over the course of this story, and this is the tipping point. She's confused, she's vulnerable, and her very being is under attack here. She's been confronted with the futility of her quest, the immensity of her enemy, and now even the evil within her own self. She's in a bad way right now, but for now, she, Jade, the human part of her, is still fighting back. The High Priest sends a bunch of pages out at Jade and Double H. It's unclear whether it's an illusion or clones or what, but they look like him and sound like him. Soon afterward, the High Priest takes Double H as well, and the same thing happens, but this time the clones tell her to give up, that she can't help, and it would just be best to surrender to her inevitable fate. It's your fault that we're suffering, Miss Jade. Abandon them. Join us, Miss Jade. We have to abandon her. The choice to have Jade fight against her companions and listen to their accusations really strengthens the impression of this as an emotional battle. They're saying the same types of things that Jade was saying to herself at the lighthouse after the kids were taken. They're attacking her spirit where it's weak, and if she gives in to despair, she'll be that much more vulnerable. But she keeps fighting, until at one point the Dom's High Priest announces that she's losing control of her soul, and suddenly the controls reverse. The game mercifully begins a sequence that doesn't require much movement on your part, but still, you need to go left to attack right, forward to attack backward. Jade has become unpredictable, even to you, the player. This is the bit where the mechanics are symbolic of Jade's own struggle. She's becoming more difficult to control, and everything's getting turned around as her soul becomes less and less her own. This is the mechanics, a simple little challenge in the final boss of the game being turned into a metaphor, representative of Jade's own inner struggle. That's kind of awesome! Jade eventually destroys the thing, having resisted its attack on her soul. Then... Well, this happens.
It's already been established that Jade is able to resurrect the dead with Shawnee's power. So at this point, that power has clearly come under her conscious control, and she used it to restore the Hillian lives the Doms took. It could be said that at this point, she has not only learned who and what she is, but has learned to manage that part of herself and use it to her will. In any case, the story leaves off at this point, leaving a lot of questions, but still some decent closure to the... Oh, come on! Uh, okay, okay, we'll talk about the sequel in a bit. Let's just focus on this one for now. All right, so what's this story about? We've got a bunch of quirkiness, a lot of blanks to fill in, and a good deal of science fiction action adventure, but what's this story trying to say? Well, when we look at the title, Beyond Good and Evil, we can come up with a few guesses. I suppose truth could be said to be morally neutral, so maybe it's a reference to journalism? That Jade is a reporter searching for the truth, something that is beyond the question of morality? But while that's a big element of her character near the beginning, it becomes a personal crusade to save the world after a while, so that seems kind of weak. I thought it might be some sort of reference to the philosopher Nietzsche, who wrote a book with that same title in 1886, but while I won't claim to be particularly knowledgeable about Nietzsche, I did a bit of research on the book and couldn't turn up any similarities of note. This title interests me. I mean, if they were actually trying to name it after Nietzsche's book, then don't you think they'd take greater care to actually base their story on the source material? Well, I guess that's not always the case. Well, as it turns out, Ansel's originally pitched title for this game was Between Good and Evil, not Beyond. Apparently Ubisoft just decided that Beyond sounded cooler or something, resulting in just about the worst executive meddling I've seen with a title since Microsoft decided Halo didn't sound cheesy enough. But alright, now we have something to work with. The title Between Good and Evil is far more representative of this story's basic themes. This is essentially an allegory for humanity struggling between light and dark, between the desire to do good and the propensity to do bad. Beyond Good and Evil builds a worldview of humanity as good, but also capable of evil, and struggling between those two. Jade is in the center of this. She's the allegory for humanity, one who desires to do good, but also has an innately evil nature as well. This is developed and symbolically linked throughout the game. It's important to note here that Jade is one of the most strongly developed female characters in gaming, and none of the stuff we're about to go over would work if she wasn't developed as she was. It's no secret that video games, as a whole, tend to have trouble developing positive female characters. They tend to fall into one of two particular archetypes, either the sexy warrior or the sensitive and innocent young maiden. Now, neither of those two character archetypes are inherently bad, obviously, and many games have used them to great effect, but it does mean that characters tend to get lumped into either high sexualization or just being completely damseled. Jade, though, is widely considered to be one of the greatest exceptions to this rule. Jade doesn't really exhibit any of the stereotypical traits of a female character, but she also doesn't overcorrect. She's strong-willed and capable, but still sensitive and caring. She's no damsel, but she does need help sometimes. She has a strong maternal nature, but she doesn't wholly depend on others to defend those in her care. She fights with a camera, with information and knowledge, but also with a staff. She has a lot of feminine characteristics, but isn't defined by feminine stereotypes. Aside from how her character interacts with her femininity, Jade is just a pretty well-developed character to begin with. We can see the evolution of her motivations go from the protection of a few, to the seeking of truth, to the seeking of a loved one, and eventually to the salvation of all of Hillis. And we can see how her personality drives her through each of these steps. While female characters are often developed pretty well as supporting cast, though honestly still probably not quite as often as they should be, it's relatively rare that they're developed this well as protagonists. And to top it off, Jade is not only well developed as a character in general, but specifically as a woman. And this development is given not only in the writing and the characterization, but even in the gameplay itself. The camera mechanic does a lot of things for this game. Photojournalism is actually a pretty rare topic for games to cover, despite being a pretty awesome thing for the medium to tackle. Get out of here, Frank West, you don't count. I've covered wars, you know. While Jade's capable and violent nature is shown in combat, 
This isn't her major method of fighting the Alpha sections. Her goal is to uncover the truth and use it against them. Truth is her main weapon. And while we tend to define most video game characters largely by their capacity for violence, Jade now has more context to her actions, all because of a little photography mechanic. But alright, back to the allegory. Jade essentially has three portions of herself at play in this story. Her human self, her soul, and Shawnee. Now, the game seems to be taking on the philosophical position that humanity is intrinsically good, and Jade's human side represents her good. Whereas Shawnee, on the other hand, is of the Doms, and was created for evil purposes, and thus represents evil. And Jade herself, her soul, is caught between good and evil. Really, this whole story is a battle for Jade's soul. The Doms are hunting her because of the immense evil she could do for them. Evil which is a vital and integrated part of who she is. But Jade herself is a kind, caring, and just overall good person. The game reveals good, evil, and the struggling soul between the two to all be part of a single being. One of the ways the game establishes the link between these three elements is through the symbolism of color, specifically of green. You may have noticed that a lot of things in this game are green, but two stand out in particular, the Doms and Jade herself. Her green lipstick, her green jacket, her headband, and heck, her name is Jade, which is in itself both a green color and a green gemstone. Green generally symbolizes concepts like growth, and the stone, jade, is a symbol of resurrection. But then the doms are green as well, but they tend to use a more sickly shade of the color, the kind of color you'd see in cartoons when a character gets nauseous or envious. So our heroine and our antagonists are both represented by the same color, separated only by a slight difference in hue. This is symbolic of the connection between these two, that while one is evil and the other is good, they are still one and the same. In this way, Jade is a symbol for humanity as a whole, for all of us, mortals stuck between two moral forces, constantly vying for control over her being. Though this is a rather spiritual interpretation. If you'd rather, she's a human hanging between a tendency to do bad and a desire to do good, the positive things she wants to accomplish versus the darker desires deep within her. Of course, Jade has managed not to have Shawnee take her over, or show up at all, really, until the Doms themselves start coming and actively trying to awaken that part of her. This is in line with the game's philosophy that humanity is good. Jade didn't succumb to evil because she didn't intrinsically tend toward it, and it was only through the intervention of outside forces that her evil side, Shawnee, started to take any hold at all. But she resisted. She did so not only through a strong personal desire to do good, as we've seen through her actions, but also by surrounding herself with purpose and good company. Paige was obviously a major influence in her life, and Double H had kind of an innocent respect and support for her, and certainly helped her stay grounded. She also surrounded herself with purpose by living directly within the good she was trying to accomplish. Keeping all those orphans at her home kept her positive goals directly in front of her the whole time. It's a lot easier to stay on the straight and narrow when you have inspirational people and a strong sense of purpose, both of which Jade had in spades. And of course, in the end, not only did she learn to resist her evil side, but actually learn to harness it and use it to do great good. I think this is representative of the idea that rather than just ignoring evil entirely, we can come to terms with it and use our understanding of it to further our ability to do good, as well as that of the people around us. This kind of allegory is fairly rare in video games. It's really common in other mediums, like the Christian parallels in Chronicles of Narnia, or the way that Inception is basically one big allegory for filmmaking, but video games don't often go there. I find it kind of refreshing to find one that did. And thus, Beyond Good and Evil is a pretty well-told story that lends itself to a lot of deeper interpretation. It's pretty original in its presentation, with a colorful palette, a wide variety of gameplay styles that it pulls off rather competently, and a very strange and interesting world. But its greatest accomplishment, in my mind at least, is Jade, a strong, well-written female protagonist at the center of an allegorical story about the human condition. The unfortunate part is that Beyond Good and Evil didn't sell well enough to warrant the creation of its planned sequel. A lot of people want it, and it, it was officially announced, but back in 2008, and since then there's been very little official word, we don't really know what's happening with it right now. 
And honestly, the way Ubisoft is treating it is kind of disgusting. I mean, the they outright said that it was a mistake once, and for that matter, the, they continue to try and like wring as much cash out of us as they possibly can, like just in hopes that if we buy this game or that game, then maybe they'll give us the game we actually want, and it's... Okay, we don't really have time for this right now, but if you want to hear the full rant, go ahead and just check that out. Next week, we'll be tackling a big question. Is story or gameplay more important in video games? And next time on Literary Analysis, we're going to be talking about art games. What they are, how they work, and we'll take a close look at a few examples of the genre. So, until then, class dismissed.